part of the conference. And I have got a very amusing bio here from Adam Harvey. In his younger, wilder days, Adam decided to do a double major in computer science and film, reasoning that film would give him an inappropriately, appropriately useless degree so he could become a Lord of the Mount Lawley hipster latte set and spend all of his time at Planet Video, I imagine. Yes. Yes, that's right. Um, he was subsequently depressed to discover that his film major turned out to be useful. Um, remarkably useful in developing websites and that it may be in fact almost as useful as, as his computer science degree in that particular field. Adam dreams one day of doing a genuinely useless degree such as 16th century Dutch art, which is a good field. Dispotian dis futurism in medieval literature or economics. <laughs> and re-earning his skinny jeans and Butler haircut. His topic today is users delighted, better UX using CSS3 and in particular HTML5, or XHTML2, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too soon, too soon. All right, can everyone please give a very warm welcome to Adam Harvey. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Um, first, a couple of just housekeeping announcements. Um, the first is that I know the projector is flickering. Um, it is some sort of weird nouveau VGA output adapter incompatibility with the projectors here. We're probably just going to have to deal with it. I'm really sorry. Um, if you want to complain, try and find a nouveau developer. Um, and <laughs> And send them my way. Um, the other piece of housekeeping is that um, after watching Andy Fitz this morning, I put, a, I put a small tag around the UX part and a strong tag around the CSS3 part of my talk title. Mostly on the grounds that Andy did a way better job than I was going to on the UX side of things, so I suggest just watching his talk on video if you weren't there this morning. So it's mostly going to be a CSS talk and I'll just touch on UX as I go. So I'm going to start by sort of talking about what UX means to me as a developer rather than, I'm not a designer, I don't pretend to be a designer, I don't play one on TV. Um, and my film degree was much more, much more structured around things like script writing than actually making things look pretty. Um, and not script writing in the PHP sense, just to be clear. Um, so I'm going to talk about what UX really means for me as a developer. Um, then we're going to kick into some actual new CSS3 stuff and how that can affect UX and also what you can use where and in what context at the moment based on the fact that browser support is a little bit spotty. Um, and then I'll sort of wrap up with a quick discussion of performance and hopefully a couple of demos and we'll see where we are time-wise at that point. Um, I do want to, before I start, I don't know if anyone here saw Daniel Nadasi's talk on the horrible history of browsers yesterday at the Browser Miniconf. Um, for those who didn't see it, I'll spoil the punchline on the video. The punchline is that Internet Explorer 9 is the best browser of all time. It's quite a big call. Unfortunately, much as I like Daniel, he is completely wrong on this one. <laughs> Internet Explorer 9 may in fact be the devil, and by the time I've put up a few compatibility slides, you will understand why. So, user experience. Most of the things that we develop as web developers ultimately are actually used by meatbags sitting at keyboards. Um, it's an unfortunate fact of life because, as we all know, systems would in fact be perfect if there were no humans involved. Since you humans are involved, though, we have to actually think about this user experience thing. I was first introduced to the term user experience about five or six years ago um, when I was a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed billing programmer at IINet and I really, really wanted to get out of that because it was Perl code. Um, so I tried to... I, lucky Paul Fenwick's talking in another room. Um, so I moved across to the web team and I begged and borrowed and bought the manager of that team drinks until he agreed to take me on. So the first Friday I was over in that team, we all went out to the pub, as you tend to do when you're a web developer, because it's the only thing that numbs the pain of dealing with IE6. <laughs> and I got chatting... <laughs> And I got chatting to one of the other developers on the team and it turned out we had quite a lot in common and we were having a nice chat. And at one point, obviously she asked me the question why was I coming to the web team and I explained about the Pearl thing. And um, she sympathised and then said that she actually really didn't like being a developer. She was quite a good developer, but she didn't like being a developer. 
And I asked why, and she said, because I really want to move into user experience. So, of course, in an attempt to look cool in front of my new teammates, I just went, yeah, of, of course. I mean, obviously, that's, that's where all the new hotness is. Um, <laughs> and then ran off to uh, very quickly Google it um, back in the office. <laughs> Particularly since this was the era just before iPhones and, generic, and general smartphone availability, particularly if you were a web developer, because obviously you'd never buy a BlackBerry. Um, particularly because at the time, the BlackBerry had a horrific HTML4 browser that didn't really read style sheets. Um, so I went back and looked it up, and I went, that's actually kind of interesting. Um, and it just turned out that we were about to start redeveloping the website. And so, of course, we had to think about user experience and usability. And somewhere along the line, we ended up deciding that full height ribbon menus were a good idea. And if anybody remembers that site, I really apologise. Um, it wasn't a good idea. But it was kind of interesting learning the difference between user interface and user experience. And that was a good example because that ribbon interface, which I now wish I had a screenshot of, looked really good. Like when we presented it to the board of directors of IINET, like they were ecstatic. It looked terrific. But the reality was the feel of it wasn't actually that good. It was a little bit less like a comfortable blanket and a little bit more like, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, the title kind of sums that up. So the problem with feel is it's really nebulous and it's different things to different people. I mean, you know, this feels very smooth to me. Some people might notice the vibrations coming off the power supply on my very old laptop that I'd keep dropping. Um, I should probably get the fan replaced or something, and might be a little bit less enamoured with it. So the different feels are different. The other problem you've got in terms of UX is that some places like apparently Red Hat do actually employ real UX people, which I think is a terrific idea. No company I've ever worked at has employed anybody with a job title with the word user in it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it's okay, We've, I've dealt with this by limiting users to a tiny remote control as their interface. They, they, there's not much experience there. And they still get it wrong. And they still get it wrong. So you've got this kind of void. Every, I've worked in a couple of design agencies in the last few years and I've worked in sort of different companies with different sorts of roles. But the reality is you get designs from designers, which is your look. You get obviously code from your developers and nobody actually thinks very much about how they come together. But of course now user experience is a buzzword, so somebody has to actually think about how this is going to come together. Usually it's the person who complains the least, and usually that's the developer. So it's probably going to be you. They will sigh and they will do the job regardless. So how do you actually put yourself in those shoes? Well the traditional answer is you put yourself in your user's shoes which are pretty shiny, actually. Um, and Annie talked about this at some length this morning about personas, and mostly came to the conclusion that they weren't actually very useful. The problem, of course, is that in a lot of cases, you've got more than one type of user. Um, they might all be wearing sneakers, but they've clearly got different taste. And it's really hard to come up with a set of personas that actually come cut across all of that. So a few years ago, Actually, just before I get to that, there is actually another problem too. Best practice is to use personas and to pay attention to usability research. Sometimes it's completely wrong. So last year I was working on a mobile version of a website that I probably can't name because it's a government agency and I didn't check. Um, and they'll probably be mad. But it was a phone, we did phone and tablet versions of this website. Um, all off the same back end, so it was the same basic content, but it was kind of the existing design kind of sucked, um, and, but their director was really attached to it. So we couldn't actually change the desktop site design. So by stealth, they decided to sign up for tablet and phone versions so that they could try and convince the director down the track that that was actually much better. So as part of that, we were obviously trying to simplify your navigation interface. Now, there's a whole bunch of research around this, and there's, it's kind of conflicting. But one of the things that a lot of people kind of pay attention to is Jeffrey Zeldman's article about the three-click rule, that people won't go more than three clicks to discover something. Um, now, the desktop version of this site had basically a giant advertising banner that the marketing department of this government department had insisted upon. There was no navigation above the fold on those screens. So, click to get down or scroll wheel or however you want to, to phrase it. 
The main navigation menu then had the politically approved uh, navigation items uh, which were all about outreach and education and whatever the WA state government's priority is this year because it's an election year. Um, and what it actually turned out was there were various things that weren't available through this like the admission times and costs for the particular uh, thing it is. <laughs> It turned out that the most hit page on the entire site was the admission prices page because people wanted to know what it would cost to take their kids along to this thing that I'm rapidly losing the anonymity of. Um, <laughs> I'll give you an added hint, there are elephants. <laughs> Parliament? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, that was at the time I believe four clicks from loading the page. So a lot of the conventional wisdom should have said that nobody actually knew what they were paying to get into this facility um, <laughs> on the way in. As it turned out, it was still the most hit page. So sometimes it just turns out your research is wrong or contradictory. There are other studies saying that in actual fact people will basically keep clicking blindly until they uh, are either succeed or fail. It turns out that the success or failure rates are pretty much the same. Um, nevertheless, I'd probably still suggest putting your most hit page on your main navigational structure. But it's an interesting exercise in terms of sometimes theory and metrics don't really line up. Um, it was interestingly though one case where when we did step back and actually did sort of, we didn't call them personas because we're not that cool, but we did actually step back and think about what our audience was. It seemed fairly logical to us that prices were going to be pretty high on the list. We actually thought it was going to be opening hours. We had a, we had a bet going. Um, I lost a beer on this, but um, it, it basically turned out that what we thought was more or less right, the metrics backed that up, um, but what had been implemented was wrong. So, but it was wrong for political reasons and sometimes you can't control those. So user experience I think always has to be mediated by reality. The reality of politics, the reality of technical limitations, the reality of I've only got three hours before it's launch time, um, which is about how I was feeling three hours ago. <laughs> and you really just have to find the balance. That's all you can do at the end of the day. As another example, PHP has a website. It's quite old. It's kind of 2000. Um, I don't mean that necessarily as a bad thing. So over the years, a few people have come up with proposals to revamp it. So that was an early build of one of them. I think I probably don't need to point out the problems with this one. Um, if anybody does want to yell out suggestions, um, go for it. But I think we might move on otherwise. Gradually it evolved a bit like, hey, contrast. That's good. Um, it gradually got to, this is, I think, the current version of the beta site. So again, navigation is a key to this in terms of what do people really want to hit. Now, we have an interesting situation. We actually have no analytics or metrics whatsoever. And the site, <laughs> <laughs> and the site is mirrored on about 60 mirrors around the world. And we have no, nothing to collate what people actually hit. The only thing we have is the Apache uh, server status page because most of the servers have mod status um, enabled which turned out to be quite useful except it only gives you the last 30 pages so you just kind of have to you know analyze it and hope for the best. <laughs> so no real metric so what do we do? So we've got this two-level um, navigation scheme up there. Um, as you can see from the little chevrons on documentation, community and help they do, unsurprisingly, scroll down. Um, it's a little bit different to a typical overlay that we, we called it a mega drop down, which we probably nicked from somewhere else. But basically what happens is that grey bit scrolls up and then the actual menu content you want scrolls down. I'm not very happy with that. Um, it feels kind of slow and it feels like an extra step. But when, you, when it does scroll down, you get fairly sensible stuff. Like, that's probably a little bigger than I'd like, but there's a bit of a hierarchy there. It's not terrible. The things that people are actually probably interested in in terms of news and conferences and about is actually there. Uh, the help one is actually even better. Um, I don't know if license information is one of our more commonly hit ones, but hey. Um, bugs is definitely commonly hit. Um, support, as in please get me the hell out of here and teach me Python, is definitely <laughs> hit. Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Um, <laughs> and navigation tips is obviously there. So documentation you'd expect would be more or less the same thing. <laughs> uh, 
This is what happens when developers don't really think about user experience. Um, the interesting part is when I, I, this is not what it looks like right now. Um, I, I have actually changed it and I'll show you what it looks like now in a sec. But the interesting part was that, and it comes back to the variety of users, is that we actually had, when I changed it to what you're about to see, people actually came back, like developers mostly, and said, but I really like that. I could get to everything I wanted. And then it turned out that they had like 30 inch retina display type monitors <laughs> and it actually fit on their screen. Uh, for most people it didn't. Like on my MacBook Pro, which is quite old, but it was 14, it's 1440 by 900, which is a pretty reasonable size laptop screen. A lot of them are smaller nowadays. Um, it still didn't fit above the fold. <laughs> it, was, it, it got a little bit further down, but there's actually more headings under that just to, just to really mess you up. So, without any analytics whatsoever, um, we guessed. We talked about on IRC and we've tried to work out what the things people actually want is. We're a little bit hamstrung in terms of the really obvious thing people want is a tutorial, um, but our tutorial sucks. Um, and to make matters worse, pretty much every tutorial on the first page of Google sucks. Um, so we can't even nick someone else's. But this is kind of an ongoing work in progress. This still isn't all that good, but it's kind of, in the absence of metrics, we've got to find the balance. And the, the only balance we can find is thinking about, well, what, what would we want, which kind of is where the function reference comes from, and, and security, and what would an average, what would a new user want? Like somebody visiting the site for the first time who can't navigate the manual. So we'll go with the tutorial and language reference, and I don't know, it might be a spectacular failure, and I'll be here next year talking about how bad it is. Anyway, that's, that's kind of all I have to say for now about user experience. I think for developers, it's one of those things where you have to be aware of it and you have to think about it and you have to consider it because otherwise you end up with that. Um, but you, equally, it has to be mediated by the various other things that you have to deal with. The nice thing is though that we now have in web development a hell of a lot of new good tools to improve the user experience. Once upon a time, for those of you who are, like me, sadly old enough to remember this, um, and I wish I could steal your joke from yesterday, but I'm not going to. Um, in the beginning, of course, there were no images, then there were images, then there were different font sizes, then there were different fonts, then there was styling, um, then there was a period where IE was dominant and everybody used Flash for anything dynamic, which kind of sucked. Um, there was, and then obviously from there we had the second browser war and we've ended up in a position where all of a sudden we have actual forward progress again on specs, which is lovely. And nowadays CSS3 in particular allows you to do an awful lot of really interesting things in terms of improving user experience and providing smoother user experiences. The, of course, there are a number of reasons why that's important. The first is the philosophical one of, well, it means we're not reliant on Flash, the world can be more open sourcey. If anybody wants to start Kumbaya, please feel free to. But the, the, the more significant reason really is that, of course, we have a much wider variety of devices than we used to. This has no processing power whatsoever. I mean, it's two years old, it's ancient. It's, it, I'm surprised it's not a dinosaur, an actual physical one. Yeah. <laughs> You know, this thing keeps stalling because its I.O. layer isn't fast enough to actually serve up data. Um, so we've got these challenges, which means that we need to be able to hit hardware acceleration and make the user experience smoother. I mean, it's like, it's like the first person shooter days. Um, who here like, remembers the original Quake and Quake 2 and so on and so forth? Okay, most of you. And obviously when Quake, Quake 2 and GLX Quake had hardware acceleration, they came out somewhat after the original Quake. And all of a sudden there were these, um, uh, let me think of a code of conduct friendly way of putting it, um, um, measuring contests um, around, <laughs> around frame rates and how many FPS you were getting and that you know this in you know deathmatch would allow you to shoot someone else 0.01 of a second faster. Um, we're kind of now 3D games dealt with this a long time ago, but we're kind of reinventing this wheel now in the web context in terms of people now expect their animations to be smooth. They expect their taps and their clicks to be responded to immediately. 
um, the patience of people, of users, particularly those who don't live in Western Australia and don't have the automatic quarter of a second speed of light problem that, that we have, really is pretty minimal nowadays. So you need things to be instant, you need things to be fast, you need to work with your browser to actually use your GPU and your CPU most effectively so you can go back to, you know, clogging it up with bad JavaScript instead. <laughs> So an example of this, now font face isn't a new thing and I'm not going to talk about at font face in general because that's actually kind of pointless. I'm sure most of us already know what it does. Most of us probably used it in actual fact. Um, I'm using it right now, matter of fact. But where it's suddenly become really trendy again is icon fonts in terms of actually putting a lot of your things that would have been in image sprites into icon fonts or using someone else's icon font. For example, Twitter Bootstrap, sorry, just Bootstrap now, um, comes with um, the Font Awesome icon font, um, which is really, really good. So you end up with these fonts, which basically mean that for minimal download, you have a whole range of glyphs available. And of course, the lovely thing about these is that they're, you know, they're scalable. You can scale them up, you can scale them down, you can do all sorts of interesting things to them. So this is definitely a good tool to have in the arsenal. The positives are fairly obvious. They're, they're scalable pretty much infinitely. And it doesn't matter whether it's a retina display or an average notebook display or a really bad projector. Um, either way, sorry ANU. But either way, <laughs> it, it is infinitely scalable and it will look reasonably good at most sizes. It's bandwidth efficient. Um, Font Awesome, which is the one that I was using there, has 280 glyphs, I think it is, and is less than 100k or maybe just over 100k. It's minimal is basically the point I'm making. And of course you can use all of CSS's other text effects on it. So for example, Wait. say you've got... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I need a gold chain now every time I... <laughs> So say you've got this lovely retro camera, which is actually called retro camera, um, because apparently Instagram is trademarked. Um, <laughs> and then you want to, I don't know, put some sort of effect on it. Say you want to put a glow effect on it. Because it's just text, you can put a text shadow on it. I don't know how obvious this is on the project. It's not too bad. Yeah, you can see what I'm getting at there. The really nice thing, of course, is you can then do other things like, okay, let's make it transparent, and now I've got a blurry version that's still going through the operating systems, hopefully reasonably well optimised, unless it's Windows code path for font rendering. And hopefully it's hitting whatever GPU acceleration it can, which is probably none in fairness, but you know, maybe the blur's going through it, I don't know. Um, but the point is that it's actually <coughs> a good way of just changing up what you can do with icons. And you can use it with things I'm going to talk about later to actually really do some interesting things. There are, however, some downsides to this. The, one of them is accessibility. If you don't actually put a label next to them or put a label on them somehow, um, you've basically just said to your screen reader users, um, yeah, I, I don't care about you. I'm really sorry. Um, which is obviously a problem. Uh, most of the icon fonts now use Unicode private characters, which means there's not even any semantic meaning to, to what's there. So you have to have something else there for users to actually click, hang on to. The other thing, of course, is that you can only, there's only one colour in, in text, obviously. Um, so you can have white or transparent or you know, blue or something like that, but there's no colours within it. Which is kind of interesting because so many of the icon fonts include icons for things like Google Plus and for things like uh, Facebook. Which means that you, if you're going to use them, you've got to think very carefully about the context in which you're using them. It's either got to be a context where you can use a monochromatic icon, in which will probably impact on your entire design, or it's got to be a context where maybe it's small enough that it doesn't matter, or... It, the, the, basically, the, the gist is that it's not universally applicable. That's really what it boils down to. It's, it's a great tool. I mean, I use them all over the place myself but you've got to be aware of the limitations of what you're using. On the bright side, it works on pretty much everything. Um, most of the icon fonts do provide EOT files, so you're fine. Android mostly works. I have had the odd weird bug with uh, font faces not getting picked up in Android. So it's one of those wonderful things where you get to test things. Damn. <laughs> 
The other alternative, of course, for scalable stuff is SVG. I won't rehash what SVG is because it's about a 15 year old spec at this point, so I'm sure we all know what it is. The positives are, of course, it has colour. Um, that kind of is a good thing. You can script it if you want to as well, um, which is kind of cool if, you wanna, if you've got like a logo that you want to light up on mouse over, then that's another way of doing it short, without using sprites. The negative is it's not really any better for accessibility. Um, in, in a lot of cases it's slower. Um, you've also got weird scaling behaviour with SVG, and I'm actually going to point that out later in another demo. Um, that a lot of browsers, Firefox, um, when they scale SVG files, don't actually re-render them. So you get pixelation as you go in. You might get bilinear filtered pixelation, which means that it just looks like everybody's <coughs> taken their glasses off. Um, which really isn't much better. So that's definitely one of your concerns. That's obviously not something you're going to have with an icon font because it should be sharp and sub-pixel rendered and hinted and so on the whole way up. On the bright side, well, on the slightly downside, compatibility is slightly hampered by the fact that Android 2 and IE 8 and below for some reason decided, well, IE of course had VML um, in a classic case of not invented here syndrome. Um, and Android 2 just didn't like SVGs for reasons I've never actually found out about. I presume Google had a good reason for it, but God, it pissed me off. So what do you use when? Of course, there's always image sprites. They work pretty well. Icon fonts handle your simple and cases where you have to scale a lot really well. And you probably only fall back to SVG if you've got specific needs around SVG, in my opinion. Um, the other thing that I don't think anyone's really using yet is, of course, fonts you can also hint. Um, which in theory would allow you to do interesting things at small sizes where SVG lines might go below one pixel width, in which case you start getting weird like grey effects or they disappear altogether or bad blending or whatever happens. Whereas in theory you could hint an icon font in such a way that the lines would always remain visible. I don't know of any icon fonts or at least commonly used icon fonts that are doing this at the moment. I would actually really like to hear if anyone does know about any of them. But I think that's something we might see this year if I've got my futurist hat on. Um, and I will now stop doing a bad Mark, Pe Mark Pesci in inter impersonation. Fortunately, I didn't let him choose pictures for my slides. <laughs> Another new CSS feature is transitions. Now, I, transitions have actually been around for a little while now, but I don't think they're getting the love that they deserve. Transitions are pretty awesome. So fundamentally, a transition it defines the transition effect on properties when, yeah. Let's just look at an example. So, <laughs> we have a button. When I mouse over it, it turns red. If anybody here has colour blindness that involves red or blue, the next five minutes are really going to suck for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, when I mouse over it, it turns blue. Standard CSS, everything's been able to do it for a long time, unless it's Internet Explorer below version 7, because it's not an anchor tag. So, <laughs> we now have this transition thing. <coughs> so what this actually means is, on this element, or any elements this rule matches, when the background property changes, I want you to take one second to do whatever transition <coughs> is appropriate between those two things. So, if I mouse over it, it will smoothly fade to red, and back, and there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's, quite, it, it's almost hypnotic, but not as hypnotic as some things that are coming up later. <laughs> it's, the nice thing about it is, though, that basically, to make that work, I've done no work. I mean, to do that effect in jQuery isn't much more work. You know, it's one animate call in jQuery, but you've just loaded up jQuery. And you might actually occasionally be trying to avoid that because you're trying to write a thin site or you just don't like JavaScript very much or, you know, you would rather just do it there. And then the browser can take care of it. And hopefully the browser's implementing this nice speedy C++ code that is, you know, going to put less... It's going to have less of an impact on your performance and your computer can do other things like run crappy JavaScript. <laughs> you can also... Obviously, there are many properties that you can animate. So you can change borders. <laughs> you can sort of try and get your mouse. It's a fun game. You can sort of try and get your mouse over it and try and keep the border at a set width. It's <laughs> so again, you know, trans the syntax for this is brain dead, basically. Border, one second, excellent. 
Um, I'm not going to go into the intricacies of the exact CSS syntax for some of this stuff. I mean, transition is actually a shorthand version of, uh, I think, four different properties. Um, transition length or transition duration, I think it is. Transition something. Um, transition easing function. So you can actually provide um, an easing function and the CSS spec has about 20 of them defined in there. So you can have linear or you can have, you know, cubic bezier or um, whatever whatever takes your fancy you know if your if your designer has come to you and said yeah I really like it but I want it to pop more you can change it from a linear <laughs> easing function to a um, to a cubic function and then punch them <laughs> Similarly, you can animate multiple elements at once. There is this handy all shorthand, which I highly recommend because sometimes the actual names of things you've got to provide there aren't totally obvious. Sometimes it's not actually the property name, so I just prefer to go with all. Um, there are, of course, however, a few gotchas. One of the biggies <laughs> is that image, image transitions for backgrounds are variably supported at the moment. Um, now I'm running Chrome at present, which I believe does actually support them. I, I actually really like how the size changes too as it goes. I hadn't noticed that before. <laughs> Chrome does, however, have a few problems. Let me interrupt this during an animation. Yeah, that's probably not supposed to happen. Firefox won't do anything at the moment. Um, <laughs> Firefox will just ignore that and flick it straight to the other image. But that's one of the nice things about transitions and one of the reasons why I think they should be used more is that they actually degrade really well. I mean, you wouldn't want to use them for a core feature of your site without a JavaScript fallback, but for smaller effects, for small things, you know, little glows on, on buttons, things like that, I think you absolutely could just do this at this point. And you get most of the benefits for basically no work and probably in a more performant way to boot. And you can also see, as I mouse over this, this is an old laptop, but it's actually pretty instantaneous. Like, it's, it's a better fade than I suspect JavaScript would do. And I now really wish the next slide was the JavaScript version so I could um, prove that. But, like, from a responsiveness point of view, it's lovely. It, it's, it, it's nice. You know, you could obviously speed it up if you want it to be, feel quicker, but, it starts responding as soon as I mouse over, so that's definitely a good thing. There is, however, a dark side to most of the new CSS3 features, and this is one of them. They're all still vendor prefixed for the most part. Um, border radius is about the only one that springs to mind that's not on box shadow now, I think. Um, but transition certainly is animation, which I'm going to show you next, so I've just spoiled that. Um, certainly is. So what you end up with is code that looks suspiciously like this, where you've got the WebKit version, the Mozilla version, the Microsoft version, because they actually support this now, um, and the Opera version. And then you've got the real thing for if and when somebody unprefixes it. This, in this limited example, of course, who cares? Like, you know, I can use Vim. This isn't very hard to fix up. But obviously, if you have 100 of these across your site, it kind of sucks. So on the evangelism point of view, I'm going to just suggest that you look at using, you cheat and use something like less or sass or something to pre-process. So that turns into that, which is actually longer, which has just disproven my point. But of course you can reuse that dot transition mix in all over the place, which will make life a hell of a lot easier for you. So I would say any, if you're doing a site where you're going to be using any real CSS3 features, I would very, very strongly recommend putting less or SAS or something in place so that it's sane and that you don't really, and so that you don't actually drink as heavily as I do. <laughs> the compatibility for transitions, going back to them, is really, really good if you can ignore Windows. Um, the good news is that Microsoft are doing a really good job with Windows 8 of helping you to ignore Windows. <laughs> <laughs> so it may not be as much of an issue as it seems. The really nice thing about this is, of course, that it actually means that basically every mobile device that's in serious use, so Windows Phone users don't have to apply, um, but 98% of mobile devices will actually do this right now. Like, Android supported this since 1.6. iOS has supported this since 3 or something. Like, my, I've got an iPhone 3G at home, and it actually works on that. 
So what this means you can do is you can actually recreate some mobile specific effects in a really effective way. So for example, say you want to have a slide in menu like every app at the moment seems to want to. You can do it entirely in CSS. Now I've cheated slightly here and put a little bit of JavaScript in because I don't really want to attach an ID to the body tag and then use target or something like that. But in theory you can do this in pure CSS with target selectors. It's pretty cool. And that basically is everything that had to happen to make that work. So in summary, I would suggest using transitions when you can. If you do have to care about IE, then you'll still have to write some JavaScript. Sorry. Animation, finally, I'm going to talk about. It's not just that. I'm very pleased, so I'm pretty sure that's public domain here too. No. No? No. Okay. <laughs> That's, yes, I, I, I was trying to do some research on this um, the other day when I was trying to procrastinate from actually writing the talk and um, yeah. So, keyframe, <laughs> key, keyframe animation. CSS allows you to set up a set of keyframes and then it will use the same basic transition engine to transition between those states. And you can do this as an infinite loop or as a one-off or you can actually select how many iterations you want to run. So, say we have this friendly penguin here. We can, in actual fact, animate said friendly penguin <laughs> entirely in CSS. And in this case, I'm using CSS transforms. Now, I'm not going into CSS transforms because I'm already running behind. But basically, in this case, we're just translating it left and right. We've got this animation thing, which actually wires it up. And then we define our keyframes in much the same way as a font face block. So, we give it a name, and then we define what happens at each time. The interesting thing is the keyframes are defined in terms of percentages rather than in terms of time. The time is actually used here. So in theory, you could reuse the same keyframe key set if you wanted to slide different things at different rates. That would probably shortly be followed by your users hating you and going somewhere else. <laughs> but in theory, it would work. So you can see here, name, time, easing function, and in this case, infinite, so it doesn't stop running. And of course you can combine various things and put more keyframes in, you can get as funky as you want. <laughs> Tux, Tux apparently is a fan of headbutts. You've made a variable speed tag, right? <laughs> variable marquee. <laughs> um, so let's look at a, an actual sort of like non-real world example, but one that could potentially happen. You need to have an open chat tab because your users need support. I mean, they're using your product. But the designer doesn't really want it to be too obvious. <laughs> so, what do you do to catch the user's attention? Well, you, with the power of animations, you could make it pulse a little bit, which is probably not really going to show up on the projector, but you can take my word for it. The fact that it's not showing up on the projector probably means that you actually need to be a little bit less subtle. So let's just move it around a little bit. <laughs> and I'm... Wait, wait, there we go. <laughs> so it waggles now. All right, what else can we do? Obviously when we hover over it, we really want to stop moving. So we've set up a hover state, which apparently isn't quite working properly. But in theory, this animation play state thing will stop, it, will stop the animation from running. In practice, Chrome doesn't seem to like this very much, and I don't really have time to fire up Firefox and show you that it works. Um, so, like that, the annoying flashing banner advertisements of 2013 <laughs> were born. <laughs> I am going to make a very quick digression into animation design. So I studied a film degree and I'm going to attempt to compress an entire unit of that film degree into approximately 90 seconds. So animation design doesn't just mean Mickey Mouse. It can also mean title sequences and things like that, such as the title sequence to one of my favourite shows, which was cancelled way too soon, Carnival. Now this looks really complex when you look at it because you're looking around and obviously there's moving pictures and you know there's actually sound too, which is terrifying. Um, who knew moving pictures had sound. And it kind of keeps going in and out of this sort of generated environment. So it's kind of cool, but when you look at it, the trick to animation design is actually breaking it up. It's like, any, it's like slicing up a design or a wireframe. The trick to animation design is to take it in layers. 
So you can see here that really we've got a card layer, we've got like a layer of people there, we've got a layer of people there, we've got a fence up the back, and then it's going to eventually zoom in and we're going to see some video, which you can probably just take my word on. So what that really means is that we do, it's actually a series of relatively simple animations. So let me see if this is actually in my browser history. We can in fact do this in straight CSS. This is entirely HTML and CSS. There is no JavaScript on this at all. Now, it's not very pretty. You can see the SVG scaling bug there that I was talking about. The video actually runs surprisingly well. I do have to stop this in a second, though, partly because I'm running out of time, but also because it will shortly crash my computer, as I found out earlier. <laughs> as I was saying earlier, if anybody finds a Nouveau developer, please send them over. Um, I, will sh I will not put the code up right now, I was originally going to, but we might come back to that in questions depending on how many there are. The point is that you can slice and dice animations really easily and you can end up with some surprisingly good effects in a surprisingly performant manner. Questions? Far away, questions. Yes. Do you want to... Wait, 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 wait. Uh, for recording purposes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Bit of a snarky question, can you make it pop more? <laughs> <laughs> I can make it pop more. Um, I should note that demo is actually pretty terrible, mostly because of the fact I wrote it in about 10 minutes immediately before the talk, so it can pop more. Amy, <laughs> shout and off oh, repeat. Here we go. I just, um, All right. <laughs> with, your, with your analytics, so you had no analytics on navigation hmm. aspects. Are you now collecting analytics on that? And have you considered or looked at using things like static navigation or et cetera for help getting around the content? Um, certainly in terms of analytics, on PHP specifically, no, we haven't, mostly due to technical challenges on the back end um, and trying to get the mirror synchronized and things like that. In general, obviously, I don't really recommend running a site without analytics if you're about to revamp it. That strikes me as being a fairly poor idea. I mean, an analytics may lie an awful lot of the time, just as your personas do, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't at least look at them. Um, I think, I think, so I think in general you do want analytics. Um, even just sometimes you just don't have the option. In terms of static navigation, obviously if you can do static navigation then you should. Um, a site like the php.net site is unfortunately pretty deep. I mean there's a lot of layers to it. And it's trying... I think it's difficult to find a balance between allowing power users to get into the deep the deep parts of the site they want to quickly and making it friendly for new users. And what we've really tried to do is sort of put some static navigation like the tutorial button on the front page to try and get around that. And that's something you've also got to think about. There's always multimodal navigation options in terms of a nav bar, but also some actual other options as well. Looking for hands. Oh, oh wait. Wait, wait. <laughs> I guess this is almost a comment, but um, it, another good reason why you might want to move what, move to those new nice techniques that you're showing us is that even old techniques mm -hmm. like sprite maps don't always work. So last week I found out that there's a weird bug in Android where if you use um, images about more than 540,000 pixels for a background, mm -hmm. they all become aliased in Android 4. Yeah. Point zero backwards. Yeah, um, I've, I've run into that one as well. iOS used to have the limitation at one megapixel and it's, yeah, it's a really, it, I think that's one of the advantages of having different techniques in your back pocket is that in that case you can use something like, you know, you could use SVG or an icon font or something else and transitions or something like that and then you've still got the ability to go back to, to sprites on the desktop. Andy. So a fantastic hack uh, to solve that problem is to have uh, SVGs be aliasing issues kind of there for a so yep. it's a real bummer and absolutely hit, especially the scaling. Mm. If you make your SVG file something safe, uh, about 1600 by 1600, 19, you know, 1920 by 1920, mm. and you stack every single glyph or every single icon you want to use on top of each other, mm -hmm. as long as you're willing to have an external, a separate CSS file to your core CSS file, because the power of replacing CSS would be a terrible thing. <laughs> down, you can then use CSS to display within a select context um, exactly what icon you want. So you can do not sprites, but just having the one, um, you know, the one graphic, then have effectively your separate style sheet, the thing that manages, you know, turning on and off each, each object. Andy has just, for the benefit of people on the video, Andy has just explained a terrific way of doing CSS. Every single person who watches 
should actually email him now and get him to explain. <laughs> we do have another question. With uh, the incompatibilities between browsers, do you recommend having a separate style sheet for different browsers and then how do you kind of integrate that? Um, I think there's two, there's two parts to that answer. Usually I, usually I would throw a modernizer at it as a first pass. So for those who don't know what modernizer is, it does feature detection of CSS features and then adds class names to your HTML element. So you can then use that to make specific style rules. I would probably, if I then had a significant number of differences, I would then break out style sheets from there, but that would be my first pass, would be that. Tim? How many of the animation stuff have like polyfills that like fall back to Java, uh, JavaScript if you can't do it natively? I'm sure there's stuff out there. I'm not particularly aware of it, because to be perfectly honest, the animation stuff is only... So I did a talk last year at a miniconf, and uh, OPM in actual fact, and demoed this and at the time the animation support was almost non-existent. It's really come along in the last 12 months, but there's still not that much of it being used in anger and I've got to say I haven't used it in anger yet on a, on, a, on a site other than a mobile site. So we didn't really have the polyfill issue. Um, I don't know if anyone else out there is aware of something, but it doesn't seem like it. Oh. Way up. Wait, hey, the AV person. Can you person. speak into the camera? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Um, how long do we get the new PHP site? <laughs> <laughs> um, that is a pretty interesting question. I think we're currently maybe in... My aim is to try and have it to switch over on April 1st. <laughs> I'm actually serious about that because I'm really curious to see what the reaction is. And if it's really, really bad, we can actually just switch it back and just say... <laughs> Everybody, thank you. Um, Adam, big hand of applause. <laughs> Lots of fun. And a little gift from LCA 2013. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, audience.